Chapters thirty nine through forty one of Lost for Love by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty nine. Meantime, Luke began to slacken in his duty, and at length he in the dissolute city gave himself to evil courses. Ignominy and shame fell on him. There is a comfort in the strength of love. Twill make a thing endurable, which else would overset the brain or break the heart. It was Mrs. Gurner's last day but one in Voysey Street. The furniture was ready for removal, the small stock of glass and crockery packed in a crate with the ironmongery at bottom by way of ballast, Jared's pictures, the guido for which he had so long sought a purchaser, and various other canvases of problematical value, swathed in an old dressing-gown and bound together with a clothesline, a battered old portmanteau standing on end in the passage, the fire-irons tied up in brown paper, the chest of drawers turned the wrong way, a general air of upside downishness pervading the apartments so soon to be abandoned by their present tenants. The day was waning, and Mrs. Gurner sat alone by her dismantled hearth. She had toiled patiently since morning at the packing, while Jared was agreeably busy at Malvina Cottage, helping a jobbing carpenter to nail up shelves and put up a bedstead or two, and directing the operations of a jobbing gardener, who was endeavouring to reduce the neglected garden to order and symmetry by means of a scythe and a pruning knife. Having done her duty bravely, struggling heroically with feather beds, and nearly dislocating her spine in the delicate task of packing the crate, Mrs. Gurner seated herself in one of the two remaining chairs and indulged in the luxury of a good cry. Why she would weep at the prospect of abandoning a place which she had long yearned to leave is a question for psychologists to answer. She wept with a vague self-pity, remembering the dreary years she had lived in that house and the small leaven of joy in her full measure of grief and care. She had struggled on, grubbed on, somehow, for twenty years, never utterly free from anxiety, rarely knowing an hour which had not been haunted by the vision of an angry tax-gatherer or an exasperated landlord. And yet, just at the last, she shed regretful tears, remembering stray hours of comfort, thinking of this old parlour as the living thing of their beloved dead, forgetting its faults, remembering only its better qualities. "'I don't think there's a snugger room of a winter's evening or a better grate to draw,' she said to herself. "'I only hope the chimneys don't smoke at Malvina Cottage and that there's an oven that will bake a pie.' Jared might have paid me the compliment to ask me to go over to Camberwell and see the house before he settled everything, but he always had such impetuous ways. Mrs. Gurner made herself a cup of tea dolefully, as if she had been infusing hemlock for a final sedative, and produced the remains of yesterday's dinner from the cupboard. But she was too depressed in spirit to care much for the good things of this life, and the blade bone of a cold shoulder had no charm for her. She sat and sipped her tea and meditated. Now shaking her head pensively with a languid sigh, now wiping a tear from her dim old eyes. By the time she had finished her third cup, she had arrived at a desperate resolution. I'll go round to Wimpole Street and have another look at her before I leave the neighborhood, she said to herself. I've never annoyed her or gone near her or put forward any claim in all these years, but I feel as if I couldn't go across the water for at my age I'm not likely to be coming backwards and forwards to this part of London, until I've had another look at her and heard her pretty voice again. I don't seek for anything from her, wealthy as she is. I don't want to obtrude myself upon her, but I feel as if it would do me good to see her. Mrs. Gurner rose and hastened to remove the traces of her day's labor by means of mild ablutions, conducted rather upon the Continental Hotel principle of a little water in a small basin going a long way. She brushed and curled her front, put on a clean collar, and a large and awe-inspiring brooch of the cameo tribe, representing a straight-nosed Minerva in a helmet, a goddess whom Mrs. Gurner insisted upon mistaking for Britannia. Since the sale of the plum-coloured satin and the disposal of the stock in trade, Mrs. Gurner possessed no such thing as a best gown, but she shook and brushed her everyday raiment and contrived to make herself tolerably tidy. As she contemplated her front and bonnet sideways in the small and somewhat cloudy looking-glass, she flattered herself that there could be no mistake as to her pretensions to gentility. It was only six o'clock, and she knew that Jared, pleased with Malvina Cottage as a child with a new toy, was not likely to return till long after dark. She had laid in provision for his supper a couple of pork chops with a kidney in them, and felt easy in her mind. So she locked the parlour door behind her, slipped the key under the mat, 
and agreed upon hiding place and set out upon her errand she went by various small streets to regent street and then across cavendish square to wigmore street and into wimpole street the professional aspect of which thoroughfare impressed her strongly she walked briskly along looking at the numbers till she came to dr ollivant's door here she stopped and knocked a timorous double knock and jingled the bell feebly i feel that faint that i'm sure i shall drop if the door isn't opened quick she said to herself there was some delay before the door opened but mrs gurner contrived to maintain her equilibrium and had just strength to inform the butler in a faint voice that she wished to see mrs ollivant on particular business i don't think my mistress will be able to see you the man answered my master is very ill and mrs ollivant is in his room oh dear sighed mrs gurner i'd set my heart upon seeing her this evening if it's an application for relief or anything in that way it's not the least use said the butler almost shutting the door in the timorous visitor's face at this insult mrs gurner plucked up her spirit i'm not a pauper though i do not come in my carriage and pair she replied perhaps if you'll be good enough to say that a connection of your mistress's wishes to have a few words with her mrs ollivant will be good enough to see me the man looked doubtful after all this shabby genteel female might be a poor relation of his master's wife needy connections are crab apples that grow upon every family tree perhaps it might be an unwise thing to be churlish to this elderly applicant if you'd like to step in and wait for a few minutes i'll send up your name said the butler whereupon mrs gurner entered the hall and was ushered into the dining-room a dismal apartment in the ghastly london twilight and containing no portable property within reach of the intruder should she be an impostor with larcenous intentions the sideboard was locked even the dry-as-dust books and pamphlets usually exposed upon the table for the entertainment of patients had been bundled into a heap and put away by the careful seneschal your name if you please ma'am gurner replied the visitor hesitatingly as if rather ashamed of that cognomen the butler retired and sent a housemaid up to the sick-room with the intimation that a person by the name of gurner and asserting herself to be a connection of mrs ollivant junior was waiting in the dining-room he himself keeping watch and ward over the door of that apartment lest mrs gurner should levant with the fire-irons or the black marble timepiece or should make a raid upon the property in the hall flora came out of the sick-room at the housemaid's summons fluttered and wondering the girl had forgotten Mrs. Gurner's name and had only contrived to say that a relation of her mistress's was waiting below. A startling announcement to Flora, who hardly knew of the existence of anyone claiming kindred with her. The doctor was asleep, that fitful slumber of exhaustion which seems to give so little rest. He was well guarded, for his mother had come to the willows and kept watch by his pillow night and day, whereby the professional nurses found their labors wondrously lightened. "'What shall I do, Mama?" said flora helplessly when the housemaid had stumbled through her message you had better see this person i suppose my love there can be no harm in seeing her so flora went reluctantly to her unknown visitor the butler opening the dining-room door with his grandest air as he ushered her in shall i bring the lamp ma'am if you please said flora almost afraid of finding herself in the semi-darkness with a stranger i trust you will forgive my intruding upon you at such a time mrs ollivant began the visitor flora gave a start of surprise i think i have heard your voice before she exclaimed yes my dear young lady we have met once before oh you wicked old woman cried flora kindling with sudden indignation i know you quite well how dare you come here and pretend that you are a relation of mine you above all other people you who might have saved me years of agony if you had only spoken the truth when you came to see me at kensington you who knew that i was breaking my heart for an imaginary grief that dr ollivant the best and noblest of men was weighed down by the burden of an imaginary crime circumstances alter cases my dear young lady pleaded mrs gurner there were reasons why i could not speak so freely that day as i should like to have spoken my granddaughter's happiness and prosperity in life depended upon my keeping the secret a girl that was brought up by me from a sickly child of three years old and was like a daughter to me i said all that i dared venture upon saying i hinted to you that it was foolish to grieve for a sweetheart that had been from the very first more taken by louisa than by you more than that was not in my power to say 
when my son jared trusted me with a secret about mr leyburn he made me take my bible oath not to breathe a word of it to a mortal i shouldn't be here to-night if i hadn't heard from louisa that you and mr leyburn had met at killarney and that the secret was a secret no longer and that was your granddaughter mr leyburn's wife whom i saw with him i suppose said flora with involuntary scorn that was our lou as good a girl as ever lived and the best of granddaughters never did a cross word pass between us in all the years she and me spent together protested mrs gurner happily oblivious of all bygone misunderstandings she is very handsome said flora with that latent touch of scorn in her tone she always had the makings of a handsome woman but she's improved wonderfully since her marriage prosperity makes a great difference in people i was counted a good-looking young woman in my day sighed mrs gurner but quite a different style from our lou she takes after the gurners the shrubsons were fair and blue-eyed my daughter that went to australia was a thorough shrubson her eyes were as blue as yours yes my dear young lady just such eyes as yours with the self-same look in them flora was not interested in these personal details she was thinking with deepest anger and regret how much pain this wretched old woman could have spared her did you know that my husband considered himself guilty of walter leyburne's death she asked and that your son traded upon his knowledge of my husband's secret and extorted money from dr ollivant no mrs ollivant if my son jared demeaned himself to do that he did it without my knowledge i was never trusted by jared an inch further than it suited his convenience to trust me many a time have i suspected that he had means of getting money beyond my knowledge but never did i think of anything so bad as that all he told me about mr leyburne was that he was supposed to be dead but was really alive and that he was going to marry our lou he had been engaged to you and it was only his supposed death that set him free of course my feelings and my interests were with lou the granddaughter i had brought up from an infant she hadn't got through so much as the measles when she came to me and i think if she whooped for one month the second year i had her she whooped for ten i never knew a child have the whooping cough so long or so strong why did you come here to-night asked flora was it to gloat over my misery my husband is dying gloat over your misery oh my blessed lamb how can you say such cruel words exclaimed mrs gurner you cut me to the quick if you were to take a knife and plunge it into me you couldn't hurt me worse i came because i am going to leave this neighbourhood and at my age a three-mile distance is an inscrutable obstacle and i felt a yearning to see you before i left voysey street i can't understand why you would wish to see me said flora the butler brought the lamp at this moment and placed it on the table illuminating mrs gurner's time-worn visage which was turned towards flora with a piteous deprecating look nor can i understand why you should come to me with a falsehood and announce yourself as a relation suppose i were to tell you that there was no falsehood at all in that statement mrs ollivant suppose i were to tell you that four years ago when i first heard of you living with your papa in fitzroy square i knew you were my own blood relation my own granddaughter as near to me as our lou is my dead daughter's only child and yet kept myself aloof from you and wouldn't come an eye you or seek to benefit by your father's wealth to the extent of a sixpence for fear i should bring trouble and shame upon you perhaps you would think better of me and feel a little more kindly towards me if you knew that is this true gasped flora gospel truth every word of it when i came to see you at kensington and spoke to you of my daughter that went to australia and married and died young leaving an only child a girl just such a one as you perhaps it was of your own blessed mother i spoke though i couldn't put it clearer it was my daughter mary gurner that your father married though she changed her name when she went across the sea on account of family troubles at home bitter disgrace that came upon her poor foolish father through embezzling his employer's money to lay it on one of those sinful race-horses which are always leading men to destruction and if there was an act of parliament passed to have them all exterminated it would be a blessing for wives and families 
My husband, James Gurner, was as fine a man as you could see in a day's walk, but race horses and horsey companions were the ruin of him, and one miserable morning I saw him led away from his own breakfast table with handcuffs under his coat sleeves. There was no Portland or Dartmoor in those days, so my James was sent over the water to Van Diemen's Land, where they took him to a dreadful place called Tasman's Peninsula, a bit of land hanging on to the world by a thread, as you may say, and with the sea all raging and roaring round it, and sharks playing about in the surf, and a chain of savage dogs to guard the poor misguided creatures that were sent there. And there they dressed my poor James in grey and yellow, and called him a canary bird, which the disgrace of it and the poor diet broke his heart, and he went off with congestion of the lungs in the second year of his time. Mary was passionately fond of her father, so she went out to Van Diemen's land after him, and took any situation she could get there so as to be near him, and to see him now and then when the rules and regulations permitted. "'And she was my mother,' murmured Flora wonderingly. It seemed a hard thing to have this ignominy cast upon her all at once, to know that her maternal grandfather had been a convict, that her maternal grandmother was a person whose relationship she must needs blush to own. The only comforting part of the story was that which concerned her mother. It was some consolation to know that she had been tender and devoted, unselfish and faithful. My poor mother, she repeated, she went out alone to that strange country to be near her wretched father. Yes, she was with him when he died. And then she left Van Diemen's land and went as nursery governess in a family that travelled from one place to another unsettled like, till they took up their residence at Hobart Town. And a year or two afterwards your father saw her and fell in love with her and married her off hand. She wrote to me to tell me how happy she was, and she sent me money very often, but she implored me never to let her husband know that she was the daughter of a felon. It wouldn't turn him against me, she said. He's too true for that but it would grieve him to the heart. It might break his heart to know that his child was descended from a convict. So I made a solemn promise that I would never hold any communication except with her, and never intrude myself on her married life when she came home to England, little thinking that she was to be taken away so soon, and that I was to lose all the help and comfort she had been to me. But I kept my promise, and never came near you or your father, or put forward a claim to your notice." though I knew you were living two or three streets off, rolling in riches. It was very good of you, said Flora gently. I would gladly have given you any assistance in my power. Indeed, it would have been only a duty had I known your claim upon me. Anything I can do for you now. No, no, cried Mrs. Gurner eagerly. Don't think that. Pray don't think that. I didn't come here for what I could get. I hadn't a mercenary thought. The little that I want for the few years I have to live, my son Jared is pretty safe to provide, thanks to Mr. Leyburn, who allows him a handsome income, and I believe he means to turn over a new leaf and not squander it on horse racing as he has done, which things have been looking brighter for us this last few weeks than they have for a long time. No, my pretty love, I didn't come here to ask for anything. I only came for one look at your sweet face, so like poor Mary's. I should never have let out about the relationship, perhaps, if it hadn't been for your manservant with his high and mighty airs, throwing out that I was a beggar, and as good as shutting the door in my face. That was too much for my feelings as a lady, and I blurted out the truth, just to let him know that he was talking to his betters. I am very glad you have told me the truth, said Flora gravely. I was foolishly proud when I thought myself superior to your granddaughter. It is only right that I should be humiliated. Do not suppose that I am ashamed of my dear mother, she added hastily. I honor her memory for her devotion and her love. But, but, you can understand that it wounds me a little to know that my grandfather was a felon. I didn't ought to have told you, exclaimed Mrs. Gurner, conscience-stricken, but I couldn't resist it when you spoke so unkindly just now, knowing how I'd sacrificed my own feelings and my own interest to keep my promise to your mother. Forgive me said Flora humbly. I am too unhappy to be kind. And then it occurred to her that she was called upon to make some demonstration of affection, perhaps to kiss this newly discovered grandmother, and she felt that she could not. Money she could give, or kindness. But affection was not forthcoming at so short a notice. Let me help you in some way, she said. 
I shall be very glad if I can be of any use to you. I have plenty of money always at my disposal. You need never want for anything that I can give. God bless you, my lamb, sobbed Mrs. Gurner. You're your mother all over. I won't pretend that a five-pound note once in a way wouldn't be a godsend. For even if Jared does keep things straight for the future, it would be a comfort to me to know that I had a pound or two of my own laid by. And if you will let me come and see you now and then, say once in six weeks, for instance, and sit and talk of your poor mother for half an hour or so, it would do me a world of good. Come as often as you like by and by, said Flora, if my husband recovers. But I fear he is dying. My blessed love, while there's life, there's hope. That is what the doctors tell me. He has lingered longer than they expected, but there is no sign of recovery yet, and the hope seems so faint. Chapter 40 Elle aimait, elle aimait comme aimaient les courtisanes et les anges, avec orgueil, avec humilité. While Flora watched and waited beside the bed where her husband lay, life trembling in the balance, life at odds with death which should prevail doctors doubtful and discoursing only in vague oracles, nurses feigned to admit that they had rarely seen a patient brought lower, even when the last awful damps of swift-coming mortality stole over the ashen face, indicative of inevitable doom, while Flora spent her days and nights in passionate bursts of tearful prayer or intervals of silent hopelessness, that other fair young wife, Louisa Leyburn, knew only the gladness and beauty of life, wandering from one fair scene to another, from lake to mountain, from wild seashore to verdant inland valley, unspeakably happy with that one companion who was to her mind an epitome of all that is noblest and brightest in mankind. Perhaps there is no condition of the human mind which comes nearer perfect happiness than that of the fetish worshipper, the man or woman whose life is governed by a master passion, whose thoughts and desires all tend to one fixed centre, whose aspirations follow one ever-shining star. And of all such idolaters, the wife who adores her husband is the happiest. Life for her is as ecstatic as that one mystic night watch in the sanctuary when the deluded Indian girl believes she holds communion with her God. She is no less blind in her devotion, no less exalted in her surrender of self, merged in an imagined divinity. In three years of wedded life it had never occurred to Louisa that this genius who had made her his handmaiden was after all of the same clay as his fellow men, molded like them out of various weaknesses, like them prone to err. To her he seemed simply perfect. To suppose that Raphael had been a better painter— or Rubens a more useful member of society than Walter Leyburn would have been rank blasphemy in the opinion of his wife. The world would think so, of course, for some time to come, both Raphael and Rubens having been more fortunate in their surroundings and opportunities, but for her, who knew him, to set earth's grandest genius above him would have been impossible. "'I know what you can do, Walter, when once you make up your mind to work honestly,' she would say to him sometimes, with a superb air of conviction." and I long for the day when you will really begin your career. My love, let us make the most of our honeymoon, the young husband had answered gaily. But the honeymoon had now lasted three years, three years of the brightest, easiest, most unconventional life possible to two happy lovers, and Louisa declared that it was time for her husband to set to work. He had not been altogether wasting his days during that sunny idleness in fair foreign lands. His studies and sketches would have loaded a Pickford van. He had exhibited a genre picture here and there, in Brussels, where Madou himself had complimented the young Englishman. In Milan, in Paris, where the critics had been for the most part favorable to the nameless stranger. The pictures were the simplest of compositions, but showed power. Lou reading a letter in a sunlit garden. Lou playing with her baby in the firelight. Lou looking dreamily across the moonlit waves. Always Lou. That most patient and devoted of models was never weary. Utterly serene had been those three years of wedded life to the idol himself. It is astonishing how slow the human fetish is to tire of incense or worship. Walter accepted his wife's adoration with a charming equanimity, sunned himself in her admiring smiles, felt that he must really possess some latent element of greatness, or so sensible a woman could not think so much of him. Not for one instant, not with one passing thought, transient as summer lightning, had he ever regretted his unequal marriage. Lou suited him to perfection, amused him, interested him, 
astonished him by the development of an ever-widening mind. He felt as Pygmalion the sculptor might have felt if his animated statue had been a clever woman instead of a nonentity. He would sit in a half-dreamy idleness and wonder at Lou's cleverness and say to himself, This is my work. If she had never loved me, this peerless gem might still have been fetching beer and sweeping floors in Boise Street. He had no foolish shame in the remembrance that she had once been doomed to base drudgery. He was proud of her emancipation, proud of that instinct of his which had discerned the jewel on the dung-heap. One day, when Lou had been reproaching him tenderly for his desultory work, his indifference to renown, he put his arm round her and drew her to the shovel glass. "'Look there, Lou,' he said. "'That is the one picture I am proud of. Work as hard as I may, I shall never beat that.' No, it was not possible to be happier than these two were, for they had the exquisite delight of looking back to days when the future, now so fair, was clouded and gloomy, and one of them at least felt like a captive who had escaped from prison, nay, almost like a soul released from its clay and translated to a more ethereal world than this common earth. Sometimes I almost fancy my life with you must be one long, delicious dream, Lou said to her husband. It is bright enough and wonderful enough for that. And now, having scampered through Scotland and explored Ireland from the Giant's Causeway to the Cliffs of Moher, Mr. and Mrs. Leyburn went back to London, and there was serious talk between them of beginning a steady-going, hard-working life in one of those pretty houses in that South Kensington district where painters love to congregate. For Lou had talked her husband into the belief that the time had now come for him to begin his career. The praises won by that last picture of his were enough to fire ambition in a duller breast than Walter Leyburn's. He had needed just so much recognition of his genius as a stimulus to exertion. His love of art had always kept his pencil busy, and he had been improving himself unconsciously during the last three years. But this taste of absolute success inspired him with new earnestness. He was more at ease, too, after that meeting with Flora, for the knowledge that he had acted meanly to Mark Chamney's daughter had been the one drop of bitter in his honeyed cup. A natural aversion from all mental effort, a sybaritish shrinking from an unpleasant duty, had kept him from any attempt at explanation after he had returned, as one resuscitated from death to the realities and obligations of life. Flora was married and happy, he had said to himself. What could it matter to her whether he were living or dead? And as for Dr. Ollivant, who might possibly have some scruples of conscience on account of that struggle on the Devonian cliff, it behooved him to suffer a little for that outbreak of evil passion, more especially as he had won the object of his heart's desire in Flora Chamney. And thus time had slipped by, and Walter Leyburn had made no sign, and it was only when he was brought face to face with the consequences of his conduct in that interview with Flora, when he saw her lifeless at his feet, and heard how she had suffered for his sake, that he realized the extent of that sin of omission of which he had been guilty. He would have given much to atone for his wrongdoing but there had been a tone in Flora's farewell that forbade all hope of friendship in the future, and then he and Dr. Ollivant had never got on very well together. There had been always a mute antagonism, a lurking jealousy. Las das vergagne, vergagnen sein. Let what is broken so remain, said Mr. Leyburn with a sigh. The painter and his wife came to London a few days after the migration from Boise Street, and while walter dined with some art friends at an artist's club lou drove over to camberwell and spent the evening with jarred and mrs gurner in their new abode which had just now all the charm of novelty so that its very defects were extolled as beauties even louisa was pleased with the queer little cottage on the bank of the canal it was pleasantly secluded and altogether an agreeable change from the publicity of voysey street where on summer evenings the inhabitants seemed to live chiefly on their doorsteps women standing in little groups gossiping with portentous countenances as if their talk were of the fate of nations children squatting on the shallow steps or swarming on the scrapers there was the privacy of a home in this sheltered little garden and this old-fashioned cottage with its windows opening on the grass plat its humble aspirations towards the beautiful in the way of an ornamental gable or two and a fanciful chimney-pot it was a strange thing for Lou to sit in the little parlour, drinking tea in state, and suffering herself to be admired by her delighted relatives, as if she had been a princess of the blood royal receiving the homage of her subjects. Mrs. Gurner contemplated her granddaughter with a rapture that was almost religious in its fervour, handled the material of Louise's dress, speculated upon its cost per yard, expatiated on the beauty of the Maltese lace which Lou wore with a royal carelessness. 
and i suppose your maid comes in for all your cast-off dresses remarked mrs gurner with a sigh and will dispose of that lace to someone in the wardrobe business for a mere song i am not quite so extravagant as to throw real lace aside grandma replied lou but my maid certainly has the reversion of my dresses you see i could not think of offering a dress i had worn to you but if you really admire this grey silk admire it louisa ejaculated the elderly lady i never saw a lovelier dress or one that more bespeaks the lady and when you have worn it as long as you can wear it made a hack of it even it would turn and do up lovely for me and plenty to spare for turnings you being so much taller then you shall have it grandma and i promise not to hack it but i should like to wear it a little longer as it is a favourite dress of walter's added lou with a blush as if she had been speaking of a lover rather than a husband do you remember that heavenly maroon silk he gave you when you were sitting to him for lemania asked mrs gurner remember it yes indeed grandma answered lou with a sudden troubled look and a faint sigh she remembered that sunday morning at the kensington boarding-school when miss tompion had been outraged by the appearance of the ruby silk and had said hard things about it she remembered kneeling on the bare boards of the wardrobe room at thurlow house raining bitter tears upon that wine-dark dress angry humiliated almost despairing to how fair a morning had she travelled through that dark night of her life she had brought a well-filled purse to malvina cottage and presently when she had gratified mrs gurner by inspecting every nook and corner from the servant's bedchamber a mere box of a room squeezed into the would-be swiss roof to the wash-house and yard where jared contemplated keeping poultry by and by when they were settled louisa presented her grandmother with a handsome sum of money to buy a little new furniture and grandma dear she added pleadingly you would so much oblige me by not buying it second hand we had so much of second-hand things in Voysey Street that I have grown up with a dislike to them. I should like to see that pretty little parlour downstairs, and your bedroom, and father's, furnished with bright-looking new things, fresh and clean, if they were only varnished deal and chosen expressly for you, not other people's discarded furniture. My dear, there is nothing to beat a broker's shop if you want bargains and know how to buy, answered Mrs. Gurner sententiously but after such generosity as you have shown me it would be a hard thing if i didn't defer to your opinion the good shall be bought new and in sweet after this and when the stars were shining over the housetops of camberwell lou and her father walked alone in the little garden and talked together with unrestrained affection jared told his daughter that for her sake because she was so bright a creature and had achieved so fair a destiny he meant to try his hardest to be a somewhat better man in the future she kissed him tenderly too deeply moved for many words and only answered and for the right's sake dear father for the satisfaction of your own conscience ah my dear i contrived to rub on so many years without being troubled by my conscience if ever i did feel an uncomfortable sense that my life was all askew the feeling wore off after a glass of gin and water but now that i am getting older and see you a lady and the wife of a rich man well I do feel that I should like to place myself on the square, and that there are many little things I used to do in Voysey Street which were not up to the mark, not quite in accordance with your rigid moralist's notion of a gentleman's conduct. And I mean to reform that altogether in the future, Lou, and to live quietly in my retired little box, and restore pictures and manipulate violins and earn my living like a man. Of course, for the old lady's sake, my life and health being uncertain, I shall not refuse the three hundred per annum which your husband is liberal enough to allow us. Of course not, father, replied Lou warmly. Utopian generosity in Mr. Gurner would have alarmed her as too unnatural a burst of virtue. Of course not, and I shall be able to help you too out of my pocket money, for Walter gives me more than I could spend if I were ever so extravagant. Louisa's carriage, only a hired brougham yet a while, was at the door, and she was just ready to say good-bye when mrs gurner indulged in a little gush of that melancholy which was her normal condition and from which she only emerged upon rare and exceptional occasions of rejoicing ah lou you are a happy woman and have reason to be thankful the poor thing that your husband used to talk about when he was painting his lamenia has had a hard time of it lately lou looked puzzled do you mean miss chamney grandma mrs ollivant at least i do my dear 
dr ollivant is lying dangerously ill at death's door where did you hear that mother asked jared sharply in voysey street promiscuously just before we left who should be talking of dr ollivant in voysey street demanded jared wonderingly i can't exactly call to mind who it was told me replied mrs gurner innocently but i think it must have been someone who had heard one of the medical students from the middlesex talking of him there's a many of em that take their sandwich and glass of ale at the king's head between one and two ah very likely answered jared with a troubled look so dr ollivant has been ill has he did you hear what was the matter i think they said it was toyfied fever poor girl said loo thinking of the young wife the woman whom she loo had robbed of her first lover it was a hard thing that she should be so desolate and despairing while her happier rival's horizon was so bright and clear but i had my hour of gloom and fear thought loo recalling those slow summer days at littlecombe when her lover lay steeped in the night of unconsciousness and none could tell how swiftly or how soon he might pass into the deeper darkness of death chapter forty one once as me thought fortune me kissed and bade me ask what i thought best and i should have it as me list therewith to set my heart in rest i asked but for my lady's heart to have for evermore mine own then at an end were all my smart then should i need no more to moan bitter were those autumn days in dr ollivant's sick chamber bitter and slow to pass each several hour prolonged by pain of body and weariness of spirit the patient had been brought to just that point of prostration in which it would have seemed to the unconcerned humanitarian looking at the case from a common-sense standpoint a mercy to let him slip away into the untroubled region of death a mercy to lose the tired soul from that corpse-like clay which had no sense save sense of pain and perhaps in these sad days flora's worst agony was to see the torture inflicted upon the wearied sufferer by those ever-changing medicaments which the doctors prescribed blistering poulticing fomenting that feeble body administering drugs which seemed to have no effect beyond the annoyance they inflicted upon the patient assailing him hour after hour as he lay there moaning out feebly that he wanted only to be left alone never once in that awful period of suspense did mrs ollivant reproach her daughter-in-law by so much as one word but there were looks the agonized mother could not forbear looks of infinite pathos which said plain as plainest words why did you let this come to pass why if you loved him so well did you abandon him to such desolation for nearly three weeks flora watched beside her husband's bed sitting for hours with his burning hand held in hers motionless as marble breathing restrainedly lest a too audible breath should pierce the filmy veil which divided his troubled sleep from waking and during all that time the sick man was for the most part unconscious of her presence indifferent whose hand held his own whose gentle touch smoothed his pillow or laid lotion-steeped linen on his burning forehead there had been rare flashes of sense in the midst of delirium moments in which cuthbert ollivant had recognized his wife and called her by name but memory was for the time extinguished he accepted her presence as a natural thing knew not that they had ever been parted thus the burden of life went on growing daily heavier as it seemed to flora for three weeks and then one night one never to be forgotten night when she had been praying fervently for hours at a stretch alone in the dressing-room adjoining the sick chamber where she was supposed to be taking her rest upon the sofa while mrs ollivant and the night nurse kept watch just at that awful hour betwixt night and morning when the destroying angel is said to be busiest the change came and it was a change for the better cuthbert ollivant awoke from a lethargic slumber and looked at his mother with a clearer look in the heavy eyes than she had seen there for a long time he asked for some drink wine anything the nurse brought him a glass of champagne and soda water the only form of nourishment which he had taken for days past and even this had been taken most reluctantly to-night he drained the glass with avidity that was good he said and then looking about he asked where is flora i have made her lie down dear she has been watching by your bed so long she has been so patient and so devoted something told the mother that no speech could be so welcome to her son as praise of that idolized wife yes poor child poor child 
I have been ill a long time. So long. That medicine Bain gave me last is no use. Chlorate, hy hydrochlorate. I am a little better tonight. Feeling his pulse. Feeble, very feeble, but not so quick. He turned upon his pillow, assisted by the tearful mother, and dropped asleep again. Flora was standing in the doorway between the two rooms, watching. What did this change mean? Both women asked themselves that question. Was it only the prelude of the end, the last flicker, the final rally of expiring nature? They could only wonder and wait and pray. It was not the end. From that hour Dr. Ollivant's condition improved. Very slow, very tedious, and beyond measure wearisome to the patient was the process of recovery, the slow return of strength, the long interval during which the slightest exertion was a painful labor. But through all Cuthbert Ollivant was happy, for now, for the first time in his life, he was very sure that his wife loved him. As soon as he was able to be moved, she went with him to Ventnor alone. The patient mother contented to resume her quiet post in the background of her son's life, now that he had his idol again. They occupied a villa near the sea, and some distance from the town. A solitary villa from which they looked out upon the green hills and the blue water, and could fancy themselves alone upon some enchanted isle, fair as the romantic land of Prospero and Miranda. Here, as strength gradually returned and recovered health became a certainty, Dr. Ollivant and his wife were utterly happy. This was better than their honeymoon, Cuthbert would say sometimes, with the serenest smile that his wife had ever seen upon his face. She had told him all about that meeting with Walter Leyburn at Muckross, as soon as he was strong enough to bear any talk about agitating subjects. She had told him how her heart had yearned for him through all that time of severance, how her first passion passed, there had been no such thing as hatred or scorn in her mind, only bitterest regret that he, whom she had held so noble, should have stooped to deceive. And then heaven had mercy upon my blindness, and I learned that you were free from the burden of Walter's death. God had spared you that misery while chastising you for your weak yielding to temptation and punishing me for my ingratitude to you. My love, it was not ingratitude, he answered. It was but the natural revulsion of a truthful and noble mind, intolerant of untruthfulness. Flora told her husband also of that interview with Mrs. Gurner, confessing with deepest humility the taint upon her maternal ancestry. Are you not ashamed of your wife, Cuthbert, now that you know she is the granddaughter of a felon? My dearest love, in the first place I should be indisposed to believe this Mrs. Gurner without confirmatory evidence, and in the second I should love you just as fondly, honour you just as much, if your maternal grandfather had been Thurtell the murderer, or Fauntleroy the fraudulent banker. So you see, dearest, said the doctor one day when he had been speaking of his great happiness, Providence has been kind to a sinner who deemed the world well lost for love. End of chapters 39, 40, and 41 End of Lost for Love by Mary Elizabeth Braddon Recorded by Celine Major.